Bonjour, bonjour. Euh, merci de nous rejoindre pour ce nouveau séminaire de notre euh, équipe IP ICT. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on va vous parler euh, de, de, de second hand market et les, et, et les droits intellectuels liés à ces questions. Uh, may, oh, sorry, I forgot that it was in English. <laughs> I just put a, a sign. Um, so that um, practical information. Um, so I, I'm here with my colleague uh, Bastian Bredongs, um, who will uh, talk about more the specific uh, issue uh, relating uh, to IT, ICT, uh, together with Lise uh, Koeken. And then uh, you have on the, it depends on your screen, of course, but on the other side, you have Ruben Van Bruegel and Adelis Meunier. So a few practical issue is uh, that that we have um, uh, so on your right side of your screen in principle you should see and be able to download the presentation. You, have, you will see that uh, it's quite a soft uh, presentation we made to, to, to just make sure that uh, you are more um, attractive by what we say and then what it, it's on the screen. But, but uh, if you want, we can give you um, handouts uh, more specific and more complete. Uh, also, um, we will have a, a two or three uh, poll questions during the webinar. Uh, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance signed by Lydian that you have uh, followed this seminar, uh, especially for uh, in-house consul, uh, if you need it for your training, then you uh, have to reply to this question. You see, it's not very complicated and it's uh, easy and it's just to, to show that you at least uh, listen to uh, our seminar while we are uh, uh, raising this question. And then um, also another practical issue, um, we would love to reply to your question. Uh, we will try to make some time available at the end of this session. You have a chat box and please uh, use it if you have a, a few questions and we will review. If we don't have the time um, and if we did not address your question during the seminar, we will address them after the seminar. So let's go directly to the subject. And of course, um, it's about a secondhand market. It has been really developing these last few years, uh, also for environmental reason, more sustainability, but also in the COVID uh, pandemic. And we see that a lot of people are trading uh, on um, on these uh, secondhand market, and then we wonder, and we had a lot of questions from clients relating to these, and to what extent they can do, because of course, um, it sounds a little bit. Uh, uh, suspicious and because um, it's common knowledge that you have as an IP right owner, you have a monopoly and then uh, you expect that no other people can use your trademark to, to resell or and especially to modify um, uh, your, your product. And so we uh, has a little bit of concern. And so, uh, Adelis, uh, with whom I have worked on, on these few issues, can, can you just uh, remind us a little bit of the principle which apply and how that it, it's um, taking into account this monopoly, it can be that some other people are using my trademark to resell goods uh, sometimes which has been modified. Uh, yes, thank you, Annick. Uh, you're perfectly right. Uh, intellectual property holders have certain kind of monopoly. However, it must be noted that this monopoly is uh, not unlimited. And in order to protect uh, free competition and free movement of good, uh, this monopoly of IP right holder has been subject to some limitations. And one of the main limitations we'll see uh, today in this webinar uh, stems from the doctrine of exhaustion. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, this doctrine of exhaustion um, implies that the owner of an intellectual property right exhausts uh, its exclusive right on a product once it has been put on the EU market by him or with his consent. So, uh, in other words, uh, once a product has been lawfully placed on the market, uh, the right holder can in principle no longer oppose to the further commercialization of that uh, product. 
And this, uh, it is this doctrine of exhaustion that allows the second-hand market to exist. And uh, for goods that are still protected by, for example, copyright or trademark, to be uh, to continue to be traded on the second-hand market, but we will see that uh, they can be traded under certain circumstances. Yes, it's quite um, uh, puzzling because, of course, um, you, you can see on second-hand market that uh, goods are also modified. I mean, it's also very trendy that uh, if you have a shirt and then you just put other uh, stuff, you, you have the brand or even if you have a watch, um, so you add uh, some diamond uh, and to this extent, I mean, it's like when you, you buy a piece of art, we have the feeling that I'm the owner of the piece of art, so I can do whatever I want. But, but obviously, uh, it's quite interesting that you go deeper into the limits and, and what we can really do to uh, to, to, to prevent uh, and to make sure that our monopoly uh, remain and that we can uh, take advantage of it, I would say. Uh, yes, uh, yes, you can oppose the, the resale of uh, your goods on the basis of both uh, copyright and trademark law. And I will mainly uh, now focus on copyright and then I will go on to a section that is reserved to uh, trademark law. Uh, so, uh, copyright grants uh, its uh, author uh, both moral and economic rights. Those economic rights are also called patrimonial rights, and there are three main economic rights. The first one being the right to reproduce the work, and we will see it uh, in detail later. Uh, the right to communicate the work to the public, and finally, the right of distribution, that is the right uh, to disseminate copies of the work. So at first sight, you might think that this right of distribution uh, seems to be able to prevent the resale of modified goods on the second-hand market. However, it is not, because uh, when you put your work on the EU market for the very first time, your distribution right is exhausted. In other words, you uh, cannot oppose the resale of modified goods uh, on the basis of your distribution rights. But we will see later that you can see it uh, the, that we you can oppose to the resale of modified goods on the basis of your moral rights. Um, another interesting point uh, is what can you do to oppose to the resale of reproduction or recreation of your work? Uh, you can oppose such recreation on the basis of your right to reproduction. And I will now take a practical example. Uh, imagine you're a car manufacturer and you see that a third party has taken the body of another car but has completely changed its appearance so that it resembles exactly like your car. Well, uh, you can oppose to the further sale of this car on the basis of your right to reproduction. Because under Belgian law, copyright infringement exists uh, when the elements or even one of the elements that make a work original have been reproduced in a later work. Therefore, the commercialization of, without the author's consent, of exact copies of the appearance of his goods constitute a copyright infringement. Uh, now I will go into uh, detail about moral rights. And moral rights serve uh, to protect the link between on one side the work and on the other side the author. The right to disclose a work is one uh, moral right. Another moral right is the right to claim or refuse the authorship of the work. And finally, the right to respect the work that permits the author to oppose to any alteration or modification of the work. And this final right is also called the integrity right. So uh, this integrity right stems from the idea that uh, a protected work uh, expresses the personality of its author. And that by infringing a work of art, you also infringe uh, its author that's behind it. And that is why uh, the author uh, is therefore entitled to prohibit, and I quote, any distortion, mutilation, or other modification of which would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. So that was Article 6 bis of the Berne Convention, but a similar provision exists uh, in Belgian law. Another uh, interesting uh, question 
is uh, the balance between, on one side, the integrity rights and on the other side, property rights. Because uh, the work that is protected by copyright uh, merges with the material medium that can be subject to property rights. For example, when you buy a painting that is subject to copyright, you are the, the owner, the, you have property rights on that painting. Therefore, uh, you have to make a balance if you want to make modification to, uh, to a work or if you uh, are a copyright holder and you see that modification have been made, you have to make a balance between on one side integrity rights of the author and on the other side property rights of the owner. Uh, yeah, it must be noted. Yeah, I just yeah. because we we think a lot of people think that oh, I buy a piece of art, I'm the owner, I can make a picture of it and sell them. But in fact, you cannot. Yeah, it's yeah. good to I, remember. Yeah, exactly. Your your property right is not unlimited. Is not absolute. You have to take into account uh, the right of the copyright owner. And uh, it must be noted that Belgian law does not uh, contain provision that uh, deals specifically with this issue, this conflict between on one side integrity rights and on the other side property rights. So we had to look at uh, case law in order to know uh, how this conflict it's, is dealt in practice. So uh, while examining case law, we have uh, seen that um, almost all, all case law uh, uh, we have identified that deal with that question concern either architectural or visual works. And for example, uh, in the field of graphic and visual works, the following have been considered as constituting copyright and more specifically uh, infringement to the integrity rights. For example, the addition of a very shiny varnish on paintings, the use of flashy colors to restore a fresco, the removal of the decoration of a photograph or even its denaturation by adding colors or removing parts. So we can see that this integrity right is uh, almost absolute, but uh, it can be even more than expected. And uh, I will now talk uh, to you about a case uh, from the Court of Cassation dating from uh, May 2008. So uh, in 2002, the city of Bruges was uh, the cultural capital of Europe. And uh, one visual artist uh, whose name was uh, Jan Verag uh, designed an art project where he wanted to identify works of art in the cityscape that following him were too classical, too fol folkloristic to be worthy of being in a cultural capital of Europe. So um, with the approval of the city of Bruges, uh, the artist placed around a statue that you can see on the slide that's called the, the newlyweds, a red and white signaling tape. Uh, the tape was stretched around metal bars at a regular distance from the statue. He also placed a few plates around this installation where he explained who he was and made the viewer think uh, is this statue worthy of being uh, in uh, Bruges, being the European cap cultural capital of Europe? And uh, as you can uh, understand, the authors of the statue were not really happy with that art project and said that the integrity uh, of their work had been com compromised. And here the question is, uh, does the right of integrity allow the author to object to any modification of the work? even non-material because uh, as i said the the red and white tape was stretched uh, far away from the statue was not touching the statue and the court held that yes uh, the right of integrity of the author is a right to oppose any material change to work considered as a whole without having to demonstrate any damage the right of integrity also protects the work against non-material alteration such as placing the work uh, in, a, in an inappropriate context. So we can see that here the court clearly confirms that this integrity right is almost an absolute right and that even small modification or modification that uh, are non-material uh, but that affect the spirit of the work can be uh, constitute, can constitute a copyright infringement. 
So in conclusion, uh, to know if you can oppose the resale of modified goods on the basis of copyright and more specifically on your integrity rights, you can ask yourself the following question. Does the modification infringe the integrity of my work? And to uh, answer that question and have a bit more uh, substance to know how to balance between on one side your integrity rights and on the other side property rights, we have identified a few criteria that can help you make that balance. Uh, you can first look at the characteristic of the work. Is, it, uh, is the creation purely artistic or is it, on the contrary, purely utilitarian? Uh, you can also look at justification that are put forward by the owner of the goods to make the modification. For example, uh, if a building is risking to collapse, then are the modification uh, suitable for you as the uh, uh, copyright owner? And finally, uh, the nature and extent of the changes made to the work. Uh, usually, as we have seen in case law, uh, this right of integrity uh, prevails over property rights. Okay. And we will now talk about, yeah. Yeah, and I see that except that sometimes in architect, architectural work, then sometimes uh, the, the, the practical aspect is also taken into consideration. But, but then the, uh, what about trademark laws? And because in fact, and there was a lot of cases where we have been handling together, um, because in fact, the, the, the trademark is, is not really, um, it's not the product itself, it, it's attached to the product. Uh, and so uh, what, what happens if the goods are modified? Uh, and so wh what can I do if, if some, uh, other trader just take my goods uh, and just um, change them, but still keep them uh, selling, sell them on the basis and, and still use my trademark uh, to, to use these, these goods. Um, I suggest, I, I know that you have prepared a few examples. I, I think that because uh, we are taking already a little bit of time so that you, you just concentrate on one or two uh, examples that you have. Yeah, sure. Um, as you, uh, you have mentioned, uh, and as you all may know, uh, trademark owners have uh, the exclusive right to oppose to the trademark, uh, to the, oppose the use of uh, his or her trademark for the same goods for which it has been registered. However, as we have uh, said above, uh, this monopoly right is subject to limitations. And one limitation that we have seen is the doctrine of exhaustion. Uh, but this doctrine is not absolute either. Uh, so even after the sale uh, by or with the consent of the trademark owner, the trademark rights can, in certain cases, be reinstated. And um, both the Benelux Convention on Intellectual Property Rights and uh, EU law um, provide that, in some cases, uh, exhaustion does not apply if, and I quote, the owner of the mark has legitimate reasons for opposing the further commercialization of the goods, in particular if the condition of the goods has changed or deteriorated since they were put on the market. And now I will go briefly uh, over two, uh, two decisions where they explain what can be such legitimate reasons. And the first one uh, concerns the, the sale uh, of a tuned Porsche car. And as you may know, uh, nice car, tuned cars... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but those cars are really modified in a tuned car such as, I don't know, as this one, the air vent is completely different, the fog lights, the bonnets, uh, many things are, are modified. But those tuned cars uh, often uh, bear the original Porsche trademarks. So can Porsche oppose to the further sale of this uh, car that actually has many parts that are not original to Porsche? And the short answer is yes. Uh, in a case from the Court of Appeal of Antwerp, the court held that yes, even if Porsche put on the market uh, uh, an original car in, in its original state, this original state had been later modified. And this, mo this modification uh, affected the indication of origin function of the trademark and therefore the quality guarantee function that is behind the Porsche trademark. Therefore, the court held that there was trademark infringement. Another case that I will uh, quickly uh, go uh, explain is uh, 
A case, con a case concerning SOFAS. So uh, the plaintiff, whose name was Rose SAS, uh, was a designer of furniture and it was the holder of a trademark that was called the Ligne Rose trademark. And it commercialized that uh, quite peculiar sofa whose uh, name is the Togo sofa. And that Togo sofa had a little uh, label on the bottom right hand side where uh, the Ligne Rose trademark was uh, affixed. And the defendant in that case was uh, Fiteso, a company that uh, brought uh, second-hand uh, sofas and restored them. And in the present case, they did so with uh, a Togo sofa and they repaired it completely. They changed uh, a few elements, but in the end, they reattached the original label uh, with the Ligne Rosé trademark. And of course, uh, the company, uh, the trademark owner, was not happy with that. And the question is, uh, can uh, Rosé SAS oppose the sale of restored sofa on the basis of their trademark? And the answer is yes. Uh, the president of the Court of Commerce of Brussels uh, reminded, uh, as I said previously, that exhaustion does not apply when the uh, trademark owner has legitimate reasons to oppose the further resale of the goods. And uh, the president then goes into detail what those legitimate reasons can be. And um, he said that there is a legitimate reason when uh, there is a change in the condition of the goods. So uh, when there, as soon as there is a change in the condition of the goods, uh, the quality guarantee function of the trademark is affected. And um, in the present case, according to the president, the modifications that may, were made by the repairing company uh, constituted a legitimate reason for the trademark owner to oppose the further commercialization of uh, that good. And the president held that in that case, the exhaust, the modified sofa were not uh, covered by the exhaustion exception. So in okay. conclusion, we, yeah, yeah, we have seen that those judge, yeah, on the basis of those, those judgments, you, uh, you as a trademark owner can, uh, even after the goods have been sold without your consent, you can still largely oppose to the further commercialization of refurbished goods. Uh, yeah, and it must also be noted that intellectual uh, property rights are not exclusive and you could very well uh, gain protection from both copyright and trademark law combined. Okay, yeah, I see. So that, that for, for this case, I think that we are quite well protected uh, if you are a trademark owner. And uh, we will switch soon to Ruben, where we see that it, it's more a little bit more challenging in, in other aspects of, of the business. But here, um, the second uh, poll question, um, so that um, we can see uh, whether you can reply to this uh, question. Can I oppose the sale of reproduction recreation on the basis of copyright? Um, yes or no? I think that um, it's quite an easy question. Ah, I forgot to... Re so that you can um, reply to that. And uh, most of you have... Um, listen to us uh, carefully obviously because um, all participants has replied uh, correctly to this uh, poll question and so we can switch to um, Ruben. Ruben, um, so um, there we are going to address another issue um, relating to trademark owner and, and the word of um, of uh, alternative um, uh, network uh, because in fact uh, we see more and more also people in the recycling business and, and the repairing that in fact uh, so there was the official network and then beside it it's the unofficial network and, and independent specialists they call themselves and it's quite um, challenging and we had also um, over the last year I have a, a few uh, questions and also litigation with regard to this aspect of the trademark. So can you uh, explain us what in fact can, can a, a trademark owner do in these circumstances? Yes, uh, thank you, Annick. Um, so basically, we're going to talk here about 
people using your trademarks to advertise their own products or their own services, second-hand products, of course, but basically other companies stating, I'm a specialist in this brand, even though they are not a part of the official network of said brand. And in this regard, we have to come back to the balancing exercise that already was briefly mentioned by Anik and also by Adalis, uh, because of course, in the European Union, you have important principles which are uh, very important to, uh, amongst others, the European Commission. On the one hand, you have the rights to property, the right uh, to property of, for example, your trademark, which gives you exclusive rights to act against others who use a similar sign or the same sign for similar or the same goods, or even for goods altogether, if you're talking about reputed trademarks. But on the other hand, as you all know, the European Commission attaches a lot of importance to competition throughout the European Union and to free competition. And it's, of course, very difficult to reconcile these two uh, principles because, as already mentioned by Anik and Andres, a trademark basically gives you a sort of a monopoly on the market and you can basically prohibit everyone else from using the sign. And this is where, uh, most importantly, the two articles on this slide come into place because these two articles serve to find a sort of middle ground and serve to uh, find a solution for the difficulties in reconciling those two principles. So first of all, you have Article 14 of the European Trademark Directive. And this uh, article uh, mentions in C that um, basically other companies um, can refer to your trademarks in order to indicate the intended purpose of a product or service they are providing themselves. And then you have Article 5, uh, 15 of the European Trademark Directive, which has already been explained by the least. This is the exhaustion doctrine. So uh, a trademark owner has the right to make first sale, but after that first sale, other companies may resell those products, save certain situations uh, as already explained by the least. Um, and what we see is that in those circumstances, we try to balance competition law with trademark rights. But of course, we do not want to harm trademark owners. We do not want to harm their legitimate interests. And this is why we have safety nets, to put it uh, like that. Um, so you see in paragraph two of both articles that we have safeties in place in order for trademark owners to act in cases of abuse of the uh, rights provided for in Article 14 or Article 15. So in Article 14, a trademark owner can still uh, invoke its trademark uh, rights if someone else is not acting in accordance with honest practices in industrial or commercial matters. So we see a safety net in place here. Similarly, in Article 15 of the European Trademark Directive, we see that uh, trademark owners can act if they have legitimate reasons, as explained by uh, Adelise earlier. So we have those, those limits, we have those safety nets to make sure that uh, trademark owners can act in case people go too far. If you notice, we can then go to the to a very interesting case, that's the BMW Dana case, because here we have a very uh, important input from the European Court of Justice with regards to the rights of others to refer to trademarks in order to show, in this case, I'm a specialist in BMW, I'm selling very good BMW second-hand cars, I'm providing good reparation or maintenance services for BMW. So that was the case at hand. You have BMW on the one hand, which of course, all of you know, and it's a German quality cars, very reputed trademark, who works with uh, exclusive distributors or with a distribution network, and who basically makes sure that every distrib distributor maintains the quality standards of BMW. So there are a lot of obligations in place, and if you do not meet those obligations, if you do not meet the standards in place, then BMW will probably say, we're no longer working with you because um, yeah, our, our network has to be exclusive. You're not meeting standards. We're going to work with someone else who is willing to do what it takes to be a BM, an official BMW representative. And then on the other hand, you have Mr. Danik. And as indicated on the slide, Mr. Danik is someone who provides services, maintenance and reparation services. That's the upper picture. And who also sells secondhand cars. That's the bottom picture. And at a certain moment in time, Mr. Danik starts using the BMW trademark and starts referring to himself as a BMW specialist and uh, someone who is selling high level, high quality BMW secondhand cars. BMW does not like this and goes to court in the Netherlands. But the first instance court of the Netherlands 
does not allow uh, the action and does not prohibit Mr. Danik from referring to the BMW signs in order to promote its activities. BMW then goes to the Court of Appeal, but the Court of Appeal confirms the judgment of first instance, so BMW has no other choice but to go to the European Court of Justice and um, the European, uh, to, the, to the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, sorry, and then the Supreme Court of the Netherlands asks certain questions to, to the European Court of Justice, and this is where we get a very interesting preliminary ruling from the European Court of Justice. And what the European Court of Justice does is, first of all, it reminds of, us of the principles I just explained to you, so Article 14 and 15. At that time, those articles were Article 6 and 7 of the old directive. And basically, the uh, European Court of Justice explains to us that um, a trademark owner can act against others using its signs, but not if the other party um, is acting in compliance with those articles, with those exceptions on this slide. Then a trademark owner can not do anything. And um, the European Court of Justice makes a distinction between the two uh, pictures I showed on the right-hand side of the slide. So they say we have to make a distinction between second-hand cars and the advertising for those activities and on the other hand reparation and maintenance services uh, which is the upper picture on the slide. So I will start with the bottom picture with the second hand cars and here the European Court of Justice explains that the um, principle of exhaustion will apply because uh, the goods have been put on the market and um, if they are put on the market people can resell them and the European Court of Justice briefly explains that in order for Mr. Danik to be able to sell them he has an interest in mentioning BMW. If he cannot mention BMW anywhere, then he's not able to sell second-hand BMW cars because consumers will not know that he is selling those cars. So this is what uh, the European Court of Justice briefly says. And it says, okay, in such circumstances, Mr. Danik should be able to, um, um, to refer to the BMW sign. However, as I explained, we have safety nets in place. So here, if you look at paragraph two of article 15, there are legitimate reasons that can be invoked by a trademark owner. So the question is, what are these legit, legitimate reasons and where do we draw the line? And this uh, has been stated by the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice says, we draw the line where Mr. Danik would create an impression that he is affiliated to the BMW sign or that he has a special relationship with BMW, that he is uh, part of the network of BMW, for example. If he creates such an impression, then he's going too far, and then BMW will be able to act on the basis of legitimate reasons, as mentioned in paragraph 2 of article 15, and to be able to act against Mr. Danik. And the Court of Justice briefly explains that the reasoning behind this is that such advertising is no longer essential. So. Mr. Danik can mention that he is uh, selling second-hand uh, cars of BMW because that's essential, people need to know that, but if he goes too far and if he creates such an impression, that's no longer essential, then you're not acting fairly and then we will draw the line and we'll say you're going too far. Okay, then, I see, yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, then um, we can uh, go to the upper picture, the services, and for the services, we uh, also have input from the European Court of Justice and here the European Court of Justice states we cannot apply Article 15 of the European Trademark Directive because it's not related to goods, so exhaustion does not, apply, does not apply. Here we have to look at Article 14c, at that time Article 6 uh, of the Directive, um, and uh, we have to investigate whether uh, Mr. Danik is acting in accordance with honest practices. But the court actually says that the honest practices, it's the same thing as legitimate reasons. So here again, the court reminds us, Mr. Danik, you have to act fairly, but we will apply the same reasoning as for the sales of secondhand cars. So here again, you cannot create the impression that you are a part of the BMW network. You cannot create the impression that you are uh, working together with BMW. Um, but, and this is the conclusion of the European Court of Justice, whether or not you're creating such an impression, that is something we live up to the national courts. That's not something we can decide on. Yeah, and exactly. That's why I'm quite interesting because it's quite broad um, guideline that the ECG is given. Because uh, what is the? Do you have any criteria 
uh, defined uh, in, in the legal, uh, in the case law, where you could say what is, um, to what limit, to, to what extent do I give the impression of being connected to, to, to the trademark? Because of course you will use it. Uh, so can, can you go into the case, Belgium case law, um, to see what are the lines that they have set for? Yes, um, so I have included three interesting decisions from Belgium, which uh, basically apply the European, European Court of Justice reasoning and investigate whether or not someone creates the impression of belonging to a specific network. And the first interesting decision is the uh, decision of the Court of Appeal in Brussels. Uh, it dates from 2008 and it relates to the Jaguar trademark. And what happened here was, uh, yeah, Jaguar is a bit similar to BMW, right? it's a famous and reputed uh, car brand with high quality cars. And then you have another uh, enterprise, the BVBA van der Borgt, who was um, providing uh, services, maintenance and reparation services on um, Jaguar and also selling second-hand Jaguars. Um, but um, BVBA van der Borgt, that's important to know, was an official Ford dealer. So he was a distributor, an official distributor for Ford, but was using the Jaguar signs similarly. So here the court said, you are creating the impression that you're not only a Ford dealer, but also a Jaguar dealer. And it referred to important um, issues in the case, things it's, it's, it's noticed and things that it said, these indication indications lead me to believe that you are creating the impression that you're part of the Jaguar network. First of all, like I said, on the facade, so on the building, he did not only mention Ford, but he also mentioned Jaguar, exactly the same as Ford. So he did not make a distinction between the two, he just mentioned both trademarks uh, in the exact same font and in the uh, typical calligraphy that's always used by Jaguar. So he mentions both trademarks. Similarly, on the vehicles of the company, of BFBA on the Burst, he mentions Ford and Jaguar. Also on the website, he refers to Jaguar in publicity. Publicity, he refers to Jaguar in letters, in invoices, in name cards. So there are a lot of documents where he always refers to the Jaguar signs and always in the same typical calligraphy, uh, same way as how the trademarks are registered. So here the uh, Court of Appeal in Brussels says, this is too far, uh, you're going too far and you're creating the impression that you are an official Jaguar dealer and I will uh, not allow you to continue doing so. The second interesting case is the Sang Yong case. This time also the Court of Appeal, but the Court of Appeal in Mons in Belgium. And uh, this case was a dispute between Sang Yong and Vast Auto. And Vast Auto was an ex-distributor for Sang Yong. So he was an official dealer, but he was not anymore. But he continued using these signs on the slides and he continued using uh, panels, uh, colors of Sanyong, uh, pictures of Sanyong throughout its store. And here the Court of Appeal of Mons also confirmed you're going too far, you're creating the impression that you're part of the Sanyong network or of the uh, official distribution network that uh, Sanyong has put in place and we will not allow you to do so. Interesting here is that the Court of Appeal of Mons also explained that Fast Auto could refer to Sanyong, but if he did so, he had to do so discreetly. He cannot do it the way he's doing it now. He cannot use the same font, the same calligraphy, the same colors. That's just not discreet and that's going too far. And then the trademark owner can act. And then a okay. the final yeah. interesting case. Is the yes, Rolex because it's case. not only um, yeah, it's not only in the automotive sector that we face this issue, of course. Yeah, and it's quite yes. important to to notice. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So here we have an example from not the automotive sector, but the uh, yeah, the fashion industry, uh, reputed reputed trademark, of course, Rolex. Everyone knows it. Um, and what happened was we had a jeweler in Brussels, and this jeweler was promoting Rolex. I was saying, yes, I'm an expert in Rolex watches. I'm selling uh, high quality second hand Rolex. I'm very good in repairing Rolexes, but he was using the Rolex sign basically everywhere. So, so also the crown you see on, on the slide, which is also uh, quite a reputed, reputed trademark and quite famous. He was using those signs everywhere. So he had presentation stands, he had decoration panels in his shop, uh, the vehicle, uh, 
of the shop also uh, showed the Rolex sign. There was a wall clock, there were stickers, there was a slideshow which was presented in the window of the shop, but which was visible from the street. There were name cards, the price tags also carried the Rolex sign, the panel, uh, there was a panel with the Rolex sign, so basically the entire shop was mentioning Rolex. And here, of course, the Commercial Court of Brussels also confirmed you're going too far, you're creating the impression that you're an official Rolex dealer. What was very interesting in this case as well was the fact that Rolex showed to the judge that uh, the jeweler in this case had certain presentation materials that he could not have because Rolex was not selling these materials. He was only providing them to official Rolex dealers. So Rolex explained, we do not know how this jeweler managed to get those items because we are not putting them on the market. We are simply giving them to our official distributors to use them to present items, but we are not allowing sales of these items. So we do not know how um, this jeweler can use these items. So here again, the court confirmed uh, that the jeweler was creating the impression that he was an official dealer, that he was somehow affiliated to Rolex. Key takeaway is basically that you can act as a trademark owner, you can act if, trade, uh, if other companies go too far. So if they use your figurative elements, if they are using the same calligraphy, the same font, if they are using the same color patterns, in those circumstances, they are going too far only if they are doing it in a subtle way, um, discreetly, as mentioned by the Court of Appeal in Mons, then probably they will get away with it and you should allow them to do so. Uh, a final practical remark is that in all the three cases I uh, discussed here, the judge attaches a great deal of importance to bailiff reports. And this is something you have to take into consideration when you're gathering evidence. If you see that someone is using your trademarks, don't take pictures yourself, don't take screenshots from a website yourself because the other party will simply be able to change these, these websites, to change uh, the way he is using your trademark in the shop sometimes and then your evidence will be gone because you will simply contest that the evidence is, is true. They will say it's fake evidence, I've never said this on my website and the value of your evidence will be quite low whereas if you have an official bailiff report it will be very, very difficult for the other party to contest that this was actually mentioned on your website and you will have very good evidence to win in court. Also, I must admit that if the person just react, the aim is to have them change, so not to proceed. So if on the basis of the picture you sent, that's okay, but but of course you have to uh, think that if the person does not comply with your first request, it's better to have a bailiff report for sure um, to secure your evidence. And, and so that um, it was quite interesting, and, and I wonder um, um, how uh, people do you think that. Uh, uh, you, you you think that the Belgium just uh, takes sufficient um, into account the interest of trademark owner. Uh, so it will be interesting for us to, to see uh, on the basis, I have my little idea on that, um, taking into consideration the, the, just the, the case laws that you uh, expose, Ruben. Um, and uh, of course, as we could imagine, we had the feeling that in fact, um, the Belgium um, case law is quite in favor in trademark in this relationship. But of course, the cases that you have exposed are quite um, also obvious cases. Uh, sometimes it's not that black and white. And for sure, if you have a good case, we can uh, surely advise you to go. But uh, you have really to review into the details uh, the next um, the next uh, topic. Um, so um, now we have been uh, dealing with trademark and, and copyright issue, but of course in the secondhand market, uh, in ITC product and so on, it's very also important and there was also very sophisticated issue. And then I give the floor to our IT specialist, uh, Bastian and Lise uh, take the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Anik. Um, I wouldn't say that it is more sophisticated than what we heard until now, but um, what we heard until now was more about the physical world. We heard about cars, about Jaguars, BMWs. Uh, we heard about um, 
linear rosé uh, so far so we heard about watches uh, i would like now to switch with lisa to the the digital world and what we see in the digital world is more and more um, we find offerings online of so-called second-hand software um, and i always wonder is this really legal because if you read the uh, websites if you read the advertisements all of these sellers of second-hand software they claim that the users or the buyers shouldn't worry about it but so my question to you lisa um, is this really a legal practice uh, to sell second-hand software Thank you, Bastian. Well, it is indeed true that a large number of secondhand licenses are offered on the internet, and the most popular software offered secondhand online is, of course, Microsoft. Uh, but in addition, licenses from Oracle, SAP, IBM, those are also frequently on the market. And most of the time, those sellers are large companies that have purchased user licenses in large numbers and that have a surplus that they're not using at the time. So these unused licenses are then traded on the internet. So how about that? Um, it's certainly a good question whether it is as legal as those sellers claim. So just to go back to the basics for a moment, uh, software in many cases is protected by copyright. The copyright holder of software, so in many cases Microsoft, has a number of exclusive economic and moral rights under copyright law, as explained by Adelis. Um, because of this copyright protection, the copyright holder has, for example, the right of communication to the public, the reproduction rights, or the distribution rights. And the distribution rights consists of uh, the author having an exclusive right to market the work for sale, rental, uh, lease, or even lending. So, to use the software, one will need a license. And this is actually a contract in which the software developer gives his or her permission to use the software. Often the license is included in the box in which the software is sold. But if you buy the software online, the license will often appear in a window that opens before the installation can be started. So the user must give their consent by checking on that little acceptance box. A license is not a standalone right given to the user to just use the software without any limitation or without anything in return. Often the license has, license has a whole number of conditions attached to it, such as regarding the user's compensation obligation, so the, the fee that the user will have to pay, um, regarding the copying of the program or the numbers of users that can use the program simultaneously. Now, the rights given to the software developer, the, the copyright holder, such as the rights to market the work by transfer of ownership, well, those rights are not unlimited. Once the author has placed his work on the market, he cannot prevent the further sale of this work, thereby preserving the free movement of goods. This is also the case for software as described in the Belgium Economic Code. So, However, we see that most software license agreements provide that the software is not transferable and may not be resold. So the copyright holder thereby explicitly prohibits the licensee to resell the license. However, as I will describe later, uh, later on, so such clause will not be legally valid. Um, already in 2012, the European Court of Justice ruled against this pro prohibition of resale in the case used soft versus Oracle. So in that ruling, the court indicated that purchased software may be resold regardless of whether it is physically available or must be downloaded since the distribution right of the software developer has been exhausted after the first sale. Okay, I understand. So if I understand correctly, but you need to correct me if I'm wrong, um, software can be sold secondhand uh, in the in the aftermarket. Um, is this true for all kinds of software, or are there certain conditions attached to it? And can you uh, give some some more insight into that? Well, the thing is, the case with used soft versus Oracle is that it was very specific. 
it concerned licensing agreements for an indefinite period of time for which a price was paid according um, to uh, the copyright holder's rights to receive remuneration, remuneration corresponding with the actual economic value of the copy of the work belonging to him. So according to the ECJ, such license agreements should be considered as a sale, which exhausts the copyright holder's distribution rights, meaning that the copyright holder cannot oppose to the further sale of the license. So in other words, the software developer in this case can no longer invoke its distribution right since it has been exhausted after the first sale, regardless of what has been agreed upon in the license agreement. In this case, the license agreement clearly stated that the license was non-transferable, but however, this contractual provision was considered invalid as it deviates from the mandatory rules of law. Um, the decision in Usoft versus Oracle has already been applied in Belgium as well. So in 2015, the Brussels Court of Appeal examined a case where software was delivered by download. Um, the court ruled that fully in line uh, with Usoft versus Oracle that the uh, ownership of the copy of the program is transferred to the user in a situation where he will, he will download the program he will enter into a license agreement and he will pay a price for the use of the software, which is for an indefinite period of time. So in this case, when the buyer no longer wishes to use the software, when then he is entitled to offer um, the software for sale secondhand. And from this jurisprudence, we can conclude that the, follow, that the offering and purchasing of secondhand licenses is indeed possible. However, as I said, the use soft versus Oracle case was a very specific case and the judgment could have been different if the circumstances were different. So the decision obviously and clearly permits the resale of software licenses, but under three important conditions. So first of all, the license has to be perpetual, meaning that it is concluded for the entire duration of the intellectual property rights vested in the software. Um, secondly, it is sold as a whole. And thirdly, the reseller will not be able to retain a copy of the software for himself. So digging into that a little deeper, um, I said, first of all, the decision only talks about perpetual licenses. So we believe that licenses granted for a limited period may not result in an exhaustion of the distribution right since the grant of such license may not qualify as a sale. As well, secondly then, the license in Usoft versus Oracle was resold as a whole. So volume licenses are indeed transferable, but in its entirety. This was also recognized by the Belgian Court of Appeal. It is important to note here that the Court of Justice clearly said that a bundle of licenses may not be split up and divided and partly sold. It is stated that the reseller is not allowed to divide this license and resell only the, the user rights for the software that are not used. And then the third condition, it is important that the reseller does not retain a copy of the software himself. Well, this is quite logical. Um, the reseller must make his own copy un unavailable at the time of the resale. In this context, uh, the court expressly pointed out that the right holder may actually employ technical measures to ensure that the original purchaser cannot um, retain a copy for himself upon reselling. So this preserves the right of reproduction of the program which is not exhaust is exhausted by the first sale okay okay so i understand that there are basically uh, three conditions that have been um, uh, that have been laid down by the european Co court of justice the, the license must be perpetual or at least for the entire duration of the of the protection of the software uh, the software must be sold as a whole you cannot split it up and then the third condition um, the seller cannot retain a copy and cannot continue using that same software that he sold. Um, I also understand from uh, what you just said 
that the Court of Justice already said that putting a clause in your contract as a, as a software developer, putting a clause in your contract that says this license is not transferable, that this will not work. So my question to you, if you are a software developer and you want to protect yourself against the, the second-hand market in your software products, what can you do? What you, can you uh, think of? Well, there are indeed ways to prevent the application of the used soft versus Oracle judgment. So I think that the most effective way to prevent the resale of software would be a non-fulfillment of the conditions just mentioned uh, and thereby offering the software outside the scope of the used soft versus Oracle judgment. So first of all, the software developer can avoid the qualification of a software sale and this can be done by having a clear time limit on the license uh, as seen in used soft versus oracle the license was transferable as it was not limited in time which resulted thus in a sale of the software so we can avoid that by making a clear time limit of course this time limit cannot be too long either uh, for example if you would uh, give a license for a duration of 99 years, well, in that case, chances are high that the court will consider this as a sale as well. The qualification of a software sale is also confirmed by the fact that it was about a contract that merely made the software available to the licensee. It is important to note that the doctrine of exhaustion does not apply to maintenance agreements or service contracts. And in the recent years, we have indeed seen a shift towards the cloud. So although today standard software can sometimes still be purchased on a physical carrier or just be downloaded, well, there is a clear trend towards offering software more and more as a service. So a cloud service agreement is unlikely to have the economic characteristics of a transfer of ownership. The users actually no longer receive a copy of the software, but they only get access to the cloud service upon payment of a user fee. So consequently, those users can neither resell the software nor make any backup copies of it, which means that the problem of secondhand licenses will, will manifest itself less and less. Um, secondly, I already mentioned that the unbundling of volume licenses is not permitted. So um, the software may always be resold in its entirety. This principle may, of course, discourage any software developer from granting such individual licenses where they can easily be individually resold. So they will bundle them into volume licenses for multiple users to avoid that. Okay, yes, indeed, I see. Um, and indeed, if you look at the market today, you see that more and more software is being being offered as software as a service. And there, in that case, the application of this um, European Court of Justice uh, decision is, is much more doubtful. Um, now, at the same time, there are quite some um, licenses on the second-hand market. And I can imagine that some of our clients would like to take advantage of this fact uh, and, and advantage of this application of this um, European Court of Justice um, decision. Um, do you have any recommendations how buyers or purchasers of secondhand software can uh, protect themselves? What should they be uh, looking at? Well, of course, there is still a chance that large software developers like Microsoft will oppose to any secondhand practices, even if the license could fall somewhat under, under the scope of the used soft versus Oracle judgment. So therefore, I would recommend that the reseller um, of the secondhand software includes the necessary warranties and indemnities in the sales agreement concerning the secondhand software with respect to any possible third party claims. So in particular, um, one should make sure that the license is first of all valid, um, that the license is not part of a volume license, um, that, the, that the license is concluded for an indefinite period, that it is just transferable, um, 
that the copyright holder's distribution right is exhausted uh, and that the seller indeed deletes the software from its own systems uh, when it is resold. In addition, uh, one could also agree on an indemnity clause whereby the seller undertakes to fully indemnify the buyer in case of a possible third party claim and where the, the seller is obliged to bear all costs if problems do arise uh, regarding the validity of the secondhand license. So, for example, to provide uh, the buyer with a valid license for the same software in case of any issue. Okay, I understand. These are indeed a couple of things that uh, purchasers can have in mind and, and that we also as, as lawyers can help them with. We have done that, that in the past. Now, a last question about this, um, this digital world. Um, we have been talking about, about software now mainly. Um, now, I'm just broadening my horizon a little bit and I'm thinking about uh, what about digital books? What about video games what about uh, films movies uh, other digital items that you can buy um, and and possibly sell does the same reasoning apply there uh, the same reasoning of of that in under certain circumstances you can sell it on the second hand market well i can immediately say that the reason the reasoning is indeed different when it concerns to digital files such as you mentioned movies video games music uh, even ebooks uh, this issue was addressed by the european court of justice last year in the case tom cabinet and the case was about a business that uh, provides secondhand ebooks without the authorization of the relevant copyright owners so the company made the ebooks available to its members on a sort of platform under the one copy, one user principle. So that one ebook would only be made available to one person at a time. Um, the, reason of, the reasoning of the business was that following that first authorized sale, the copyright owners would lose the rights to control any subsequent distributions of such a copy and that therefore selling the ebooks secondhand would be lawful. Uh, Tom Cabinet reasoned that the rights of distribution would be exhausted after the first sale, just like was decided in the Usosoft versus Oracle case. Um, the European Court of Justice did not follow the same reasoning and decided that it was clearly that there was clearly a difference between software on the one hand and digital content. The court distinguished between different types of rights granted by copyright and defined the application thereof. So for software, it was already decided that the distribution right was exhausted after the first sale. But in this case, the European Court of Justice considered that the online provision of an ebook falls within the rights to communication to the public and not just the, the distribution right. So, as such, the relevant copyright owner retains the rights to control any subsequent acts of communication to the public of their work, even after this first communication. So, unlike the distribution right, in fact, the right of communication to the public can never be exhausted, the court said. So, the European Court of Justice decided that reselling ebooks is not allowed and viola violates copyright law. This makes ebooks and other types of digital content, uh, such as movies or, or video games, different from, well, first of all, regular books, so, so physical books on the one hand and uh, software on the other hand. There is indeed a difference between the sale of a used physical book, which is allowed under the general rule that, that Adelise explained about exhaustion, and an ebook, which is here not allowed. The court thus ruled in favor of the, the publishers in this case, mainly on the grounds that copies of an ebook will always be as new. So while a paper, paper book will wear out more and more and becomes a real secondhand book, this is not the case for a digital file. Um, the court also took into account the fact that digital books are obviously much easier to distribute than the paper copies by, by merely making them available on a platform. 
It follows that the copyright owners will be able to take action against anyone who sells pre-owned digital copies of books, of, of video games, of music, of movies, and so on, without their consent. The only exception will remain um, that when it is considered pure software. However, it should be noted that software often contains music, graphics, etc., etc., and this will likely fall into the application of the general rule due to the fact that the case law has progressively narrowed down the scope of what qualifies as software. So in this sense, as mentioned, video games, for example, would follow the general rule and cannot um, be resold. Okay, okay. So I see there's a clear difference between pure software on the one hand and um, and and other digital uh, items such as ebooks uh, and so on on the uh, other hand thank you very much lisa um i guess because we are a bit short on time that we go to the to the poll question um the poll question is can the offering of second hand software be prohibited in the software license and i think we have given a clear answer on that okay um, I think we are coming, we're nearing the end of our, of our webinar. Let's go uh, have a quick look at the questions that we received. There's one question that we received, and I think that's more a question either for uh, Ruben, Anik, or, or Adelis. Um, yes. Uh... It, it, it asks the question, so back to the possible legal basis to forbid someone to sell modified products under the original uh, brand or trademark, and more generally to forbid um, him to to associate himself or itself with products or services can consumer laws be invoked uh, on the basis of uh, consumer deception i think a, a very interesting question yes and uh, thank you uh, francois to uh, raise this question i'm happy that you are listening to us today and uh, i hope we will meet soon in the real life um, yes, for sure, uh, and uh, we always, as mentioned um, by Adelis, we usually, in these kind of cases, we, we um, grant our legal action or cease and desist letter on several grants. Of course, the trademark one is the easiest one, um, because it's clear-cut cases where the uh, consumer protection or what we have in Belgium, what we call the trade practice, um, so that we, we can use them also as a legal basis, but uh, sometimes uh, it's more tricky. Uh, so that's why we, we prefer just to concentrate if we have a clear cut case on the tra trademark aspect, um, because then it, it's more challenging in terms of evidence uh, for the consumer protection aspect. I don't know if the other wants to uh, add something because I think that everybody wants to go back to their file. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there was any other question, uh, Bastian. Uh, no, um, I think uh, I just, just one uh, question that I received. And I, I think that's more a question for, for Ruben. I think, Ruben, during your uh, presentation, you, you mentioned the Court of Appeals in Mons that stated that companies can refer to trademarks to promote sales of second-hand goods or reparation services if they do so discreetly. Um, is there a good example in case law? Can you just quickly give, give one? Uh, yes, I came across, for example, an interesting case in Leuven where um, there was a designer of wedding dresses and uh, she used the trademark Linea Raffaelli and um, she was selling those products and then there was another shop in, in Leuven as well who was selling second-hand uh, wedding dresses of her trademark and in this case the uh, other shop simply mentioned on the website I'm selling the following brands in my store and just wrote Linea Raffaelli also together with other trademarks uh, and there the court said in those circumstances we cannot prohibit her from doing so she's not using the other shop is not using your figurative trademarks it's not referring to their your typical color patterns it's just mentioning on the website your word Raffaella just to indicate yeah I have those dresses in my store and there the court allowed it and said we will not prohibit this use of the trademark 
Okay, yeah, very, should... very clear. Yeah, if you use just a verbal trademark, it, it will be hard to, to, uh, to yeah. obtain uh, a decision. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay, well, I would like to uh, conclude this uh, this webinar. I think uh, we have talked about the second-hand market. We have looked at it from a, a trademark point of view. We have looked at it with at least um, from a copyright point of view. And, and with Lisa, we have uh, looked at it from a, a software rights, also copyright or copywriting software uh, point of view. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this. If you have any questions on, on this matter, please do not hesitate uh, to, to contact any uh, of us. Uh, we remain available for your questions. And then uh, leaves me nothing to do but to, to thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar and hope to see you live uh, soon um, in, the, in the future. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, have a nice afternoon.